It's funny because I asked Brian, um, you know, what what was what was the theme today? Like, what what theme should I be thinking about with these three films? And he said, you know, you're you're they're documentaries. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, okay, they're documentaries. Um, <laughs> and I think um, it's a funny thing too. I, I, having watched all three films, there are some things that are very interesting in the way that your films resonate. And you haven't probably seen each other's films. Um, I but uh, I hope you do. Um, but it, it's very interesting to see how the documentary form is used in so many different ways, actually, in your films. Um, but yet there are so many, there are thematic things, there, there are issues, I was trying to think about memory, um, closure, you know, all of your films actually deal with the themes of that as well. But I thought maybe I would just start by asking, start with you, Jacob, to just talk a little bit about your film. Yeah. Um, and particularly how you came to decide to make, to make it, and what, what drew you to it? Well, uh, I had seen a number of really great culture documentaries over the last few years. I mean, I think we're, we're at a kind of um, high moment for documentary art, particularly with, you know, Bill Cunningham and the Joan Rivers film. Uh, I had loved the Deanna Vreeland movie as well. Um, and. And so when my mother died, I knew that I was going to find a way to, to deal with it as a, as a writer and a creative person. Um, but I, I did really feel that it would be um, more fun in a certain way to make a documentary than to write a book. And she had, um, she had written so much about herself that I didn't think I was going to write something that people read um, that was going to be nearly as resonant as something that you could watch. And the fact that her death had been a secret when um, everything else had seemingly been, uh, you know, subject for, for material, um, gave it a kind of entry point for me. Yeah. And, um, and, and so that's sort of how it happened. Well, I'm interested in this notion of um, deciding that something should be a film and not a book. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's it's a very interesting time, as you said. In our it, as documentary filmmakers, I think we went through a wave, and it's still somewhat there of social issue documentaries, and even funding was available, almost strictly speaking, for social issue documentaries, and not films about culture, about artists. Um, and I'm just, if I could just add, ask, uh, talk a little bit more about this notion of what what do you think a film brings to your story like this? as opposed to the written word? Well, I think that one thing is that, that it was going to allow, even, even with, we have about 40 people who are interviewed on screen, and, um, but even with them, doing it on film allowed her to be the star, to use the, the archive material of her, the, the old interviews, the, the clips of her on television, um, that, that you could, bring her back to life in a certain way on screen in a way that you perhaps couldn't in a book. Um, again, partly because she's so alive and there uh, in her own essays and, uh, you know, and, and in Heartburn, her, her novel, which is sort of loosely based on, um, more than loosely based on, on her divorce from my father. So, um, and then that was an entry point as well. For, for other reasons. James, do you want to talk just a little bit about your film? And sure. Ha, ha, just curious, because there's a broad generational cross-section. How many people know the name Kitty Genovese? Just so not, not everyone in the room. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Kitty Genovese is uh, famously or infamously known uh, for having been murdered reportedly in front of uh, 38 of her neighbors in Kew Gardens, Queens in 1964 and became, in a sense, the, um, the representative, emblematic of bystander non-intervention. And, and many students uh, are taught her story in sociology or psychology classes. Um, I am, by background, a screenwriter. And to answer your question about um, book or, yeah. uh, this began for me uh, in the late 1990s as a screenplay uh, based on the famous story of Kitty Genovese. And in the course, uh, I was collaborating at the time with um, a, a wonderful documentary filmmaker named Joe Berlinger and a playwright, also wonderful, named Alfred Urey for a project for HBO. And this was in the late 1990s. And at that time, 
started to meet some of the people who were uh, directly or indirectly affected by Kitty's murder and got an inkling that that story wasn't quite what it was said to be. And I have always been interested in um, sort of the story behind the story. Stories, uh, yeah, iconic stories we think we know. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been much of my writing work. Um, the project, as happens, never happened. Uh, and in 2003, 2004, um, I was still thinking about the people that I had met. Uh, and the New York Times, who had br they had broken the original story in 1964 that made this her so famous, they then revisited their story and questioned the accuracy. One of the people that I had met was her brother, Bill Genovese, who had been not just affected by the profound loss of his sibling, but also by that story. And it had colored, uh, dramatically impacted his life. And if you see the film, you'll understand in what ways. And so he was, he is uh, in every respect a truth seeker, an indomitable truth seeker. And he was determined to find the truth as to what happened. So far as you can, when you start in 2004, 40 years after a crime. And so uh, my colleague, Melissa Jacobson, who uh, co-produced it, we have spent the last 11 years uh, making that film. And uh, that's sort of the, the origin and just the, the inception of the project. It's, it's, a, it's a terrific film, and I think it, it does uh, touch on, uh, again, some of these themes of memory that we can talk a little bit about in a moment. But Laura, might we talk a little bit about your film, if you don't mind? Well, I, I worked with Robert Frank for um, over two decades, and um, just working with him and sitting next to him and um, seeing the outtakes of the film and seeing him work has really affected my life so much. Um, creatively and also personally. Um, so I felt like I had a unique opportunity to share that position I, I had, that point of view with other people. And I think that it, it, you know, he's not the type of person, and you'll see that in the film, that you could just ask, hey, so how do you do your photographs? What do you think about? You know, he's not gonna answer that. But I think once you get to know someone and you see them work and, and, and uh, you um, have like extended conversations with them, uh, you get to see that point of view and, and where their creative inspiration comes from. Well, I just want to pull a quote from him because it <laughs> reminded me, it really resonated for me because he says, film is still alive, but photographs are a memory you put in a drawer. And I thought that was just so fascinating that, you know, as a gentleman who's a filmmaker and a photographer, that for him, the film is the thing to revisit okay. that's more alive than his photographs, which are just that, that moment, that moment. Um, each of you use film and home movies to great effect, I think, actually, and I'm, you know, in really it. both instances, and all, all your instances, and I think um, that reminded me quite a lot of how do you create, e and each of you are also dealing with different time periods and trying to sort of recreate that, those moments, and maybe you could just start and talk a little bit about, you have a very rich uh, archive of material to go, well, you know, thank it's goodness. amazing. <laughs> So well, it's amazing. a very yeah. it's a very extended period of time that I'm trying to show because he's 90 years old and he started working, you know, in the 50s. So in order to show all of that, um, you really do need um, a lot of archive, and uh, you know, a lot of it comes from Robert. But then, because he's been so shy in front of the camera, it was really difficult to find him on camera and photographs of him and. Uh, but I found it, and I think there's some great stuff there. Um, but uh, I do think that that's one of the most difficult things to do, is, is to go back in time and try to portray not just like dates and what happened, but the feeling that people had at the time. And I think that that's really what you have to really work hard for. You know, it, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, the two f subjects of your film are known for their work, what they've created their life work, what their, their voice. And the subject of the witness is only known for the last 30 minutes of her life. Wow. And, but she's not just known, she's an iconic figure for the last 30 minutes of her life. She was a 28-year-old woman. Family, the tragedy was so public and so horrifying that the erasure of her life 
and she had a full, at 28 years, she had a full life, but that life was not only erased publicly, but also within the family. And so much of the film is about her brother trying to reclaim her life from her death, which is what I think has made this film um, so resonant for those of us who have been on this journey, that, we, that it is a person uh, and this extraordinary guy, Bill Genovese, who all of us who have met him and spent time with him admire him with such high regard as he tries to piece together, in a sense, through fragments of images. It's not, there isn't any trove of archival. In fact, the image that she's known for is this iconic, which has a turning point in the narrative, and he didn't even know where the image came from, but it's an image that made her a, the public face of uh, apathy. I'm and just and, and you should say I'm sorry that that it turns out to be her mugshot, right? Uh, I mean that's spoiler alert. Spoiler. <laughs> I'm just oh, in. Oh. What you'll watch it anyway. What? I'm just in awe of how you managed to do a, an entire movie about something that had happened 50 years ago. Because, I mean, even um, going into this, I, I don't think I remotely was prepared for how difficult it would be in certain ways to do a documentary about a person who wasn't alive. And that person was my mother and she was really famous. So it was, you know, th there was a lot more footage, but even even still it was like, we would watch things that were sort of good, but they'd, they'd all been, a lot of them had been out there, some of them had, yeah. had been widely watched on YouTube. Um, and And so you kind of go, well, how do I, Manage to do this without it becoming a greatest hits reel, but, yeah. but well, that's it's yeah. such a. I mean, so so the film is actually not about Kitty Genovese. It's about Bill Genovese and Jacob. You nailed it. I mean, that is essentially the dilemma: is the person who comes to life is the living, and he is the vessel for communicating and bringing to us this person. But it really is a film about a living person and how that living person deals uh, with his yeah. and their loss. And that's the film is fundamentally about how he will live his life, not how Kitty lived her life or, so it's a very, it, uh, that's how we, ser we dealt with that challenge. And I didn't know at the time when I started that that's the shift that would occur. So it's a very interesting point. So did you shift the point of view in the middle of working on the film? And then I sh I change the emphasis? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. I, I shifted it um, when I started after realizing and that the people, that uh, your mother was a screenwriter who will, uh, any of us who aspire to be a screenwriter will never approach her. her um, well, some of you will. I mean, well, okay, <laughs> I, I won't. But that's and the what kind I of thing you had to break no. in your documentary, and one of the right? things You had to break that down. <laughs> One of the things that I realized was I couldn't possibly, I don't have the skill set to evoke the lives or to um, convey what I had experienced in talking to people about their experiences. They could do it much better than I could, and that's how the shift occurred. Yes, I think that was one of the things actually for me as well was that, um, and because her death had been a secret and had been difficult for people to process, I, I, I absolutely believed that one of the things that would be interesting was to see how um, how all of these people, some of them really famous, some of them a little entitled, had, um, had handled having this friend who had held, with, withheld this essential piece of information from them. Uh, and, um, and, and that, that really, I, I think, helped us in some way. Well, you also, you're in your film, so you're, you know, you do personalize it in a way you make it very clear from the very beginning, from those first moments. Yeah. That you're, it's a story that you're helping to tell as well. Um, and it's interesting, I didn't, I don't think I realized in the, f in the watching m the film that you were in, in so instricably involved in his life as well. Um, I mean, I kind of did, but not quite as fully. And, Bill is the one who tells the story. So it's interesting that you have these different people, you know, you're, it's biography in some ways. Each of your films in some ways is a biography telling a story, but your, your approaches are all very, very different. 
in large. I'm just right. I'm not really in the film. I don't talk, but I am. But but I like showing the process of making the film. So you see the film crew, and we have we talk to Robert, and Robert talks back. So it's sort of like almost like a conversation, rather than um, yeah. a monologue, in any way. Can I? I'm curious for the two of you. Um, what? Um, what? Who is the um, the uh, the the critic internal within your was it for you uh, Robert Frank was it for you uh, a family member who was it that you whose whose uh, affirmation or validation that you were most nervous about um, uh well there there were a number um, one of the first things that I did was um, when I decided that I was going to make it I I went to see Mike Nichols um, who um, was it was probably about a year and a half before he died. And, and Mike said to me, if you were going to do this, uh, you better be prepared to deal with your parents' divorce because that was the pivot point in her career. And that is your film in a certain way. I, I think that Mike didn't realize then the degree to which the death would also, would be not the pivot point, but the, um, well, because it became a secret, it, it was the second pivot in some way. But, but he was absolutely right that it was my entry point. How, how, does, uh, how does choosing to write about um, this experience that happened to our family impact um, not just her, but the, the, the person who, the perpetrator, or the children, how the children view their father, and, and that became one of the things that I was trying to play gently with um, working out. And, and, and so then my father was also, um, you know, it, it was very difficult. And it, and it took quite a long time to get my father on board. He was the, the last person that we interviewed. Um, we did it uh, weeks before we submitted to the New York Film Festival. Um, and, and I think he gave us exactly what we needed. Um, but. But it was, you know, he, I, he had a very tough time uh, dealing with sort of the symbol that he became for kind of cheating spouses. And, and, um, and for a while, at least, it had seemed to be kind of over. Um, their tabloid narrative was over. And then suddenly, here's his son going, oh, you know, I think I'm going to make a documentary <laughs> about this, you know? And, um, and uh, and I think he worried quite rightfully, you know, sort of, is this going to be something that is uh, classy and literary, or is this going to be an incredibly self-indulgent, um, you know, Kardashian-esque um, endeavor? It is not a Kardashian. So I guess <laughs> Thank you. If you just I, need I, to I know hope that. not. Yeah, I saw the velvet-covered car today in the subway, and I was like, oh my god, what's happening? <laughs> so, uh, but I don't think you can go into a project with that in mind. I mean, I understand why you would, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have done this project if I was thinking that I had needed Robert's approval. And I do have to say on his behalf that he said to me many times, I trust you implicitly. If I didn't, you wouldn't be doing this right now. And that gave me so much uh, strength and so much hope, I mean, and so much confidence in what I was doing that I felt like I could do anything. I mean, so. and isn't that critical when you're making a documentary about anyone, that the trust is, is right. the key, right? And I think once, he's like very decisive, so I said, once I trust you, I trust you. Right. I and felt that in your that film, too, uh, very much, that Billy, we really trusted you in, with his story, and the family trusted you, and you were true to them. Well, the reason I mentioned Melissa and, other, and their others is because he trusted all. all uh, I mean, you're, you, you, have a, you end up having a small family that basically moves in. And Melissa and I were talking about this today, because we were sort of, would we have allowed our, our lives to be visited in the way that they have? I think what's fascinating is these projects take so long. This took, uh, for me, 11 years um, as a documentary. Forget about the 1990s part. Is what happens to you and how you, how you find out why you're making the film or yeah. your reasons for making it. I was making a film about a brother who lost a sibling in 2004. 
and in the course of making a film about a brother who lost a sibling, my only brother, my only sibling, got sick and died. So I was making a film about sibling loss without even knowing it, and that's what the film ended up being about. Um, wow. And it's a love story. For me, it's um, the way Bill, and clearly I can tell, I have not seen your film, I can tell yours is a love story, um, an ode. Uh, I, I suspect, based on if Robert Frank said that about you, that there's a great deal of love there. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, uh, but mine was a love story for, uh, about making a film about a, a man who loved his sister so much that he would go to any length to be as close to her as he possibly could be. I, I, I think it's, it's so interesting though as well with all of your films really is that you have the advantage of being able to look back, right? And so you can look back on the, and, and as artists you can look back on Nora, you can look back on Robert and say, well, these choices that they made led them to create art this way, to create these pieces. And I thought a lot about Billy too that how his whole life was affected by this one event and how you can't really know that until you look back, you know, and really see it in retrospect, right? Um, and I, you know, I've made a film about an artist myself and I spent two and a half years with him and it was a writer. And it's very challenging to think about how do you express what a writer does? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you shoot a writer? Yeah. They're typing, Visually. they're, you know, yeah. it's a very so difficult, process, um, and I thought also in, in your film particularly um, that you really captured the essence of what she was, what, what was behind the writing. Mm -hmm. it didn't, you didn't have to watch her with her pen. Right. But um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about her. The film itself really does track her work as an artist. Yes, and, and one of actually the hardest things to do was <laughs> figuring out how to bring the text alive. I mean, um, Particularly, we found early on a clip of, of her. Uh, she had done a kind of extended interview with The South Bank Show, which is a British uh, documentary series that had run um, in the mid-90s. And she had read parts of Heartburn, the novel that she wrote about her divorce with my dad. Um, and so that helped us enormously, because you could see the wit, you could see the you could see a little bit of the ruthlessness, you could see a little bit of the bitterness, you could see the, that it was all right there for you to see. Um, but the essays in the 70s, which I knew were gonna be essential, uh, and, and, and incidentally, she had read the last two collections of books that she had written, she had done on tape. So that was one of the things that I was operating early on with the sort of awareness that we would wind up using. Um, that we would literally go to those audio books and, 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 and kind of illustrate them in some way. Uh, but the early essays we didn't have, and so we had some of the actresses who worked with her uh, do readings. I don't think that our interludes were necessarily as artistically um, innovative as you know what you saw in, I, who saw Cutie and the Boxer? Um, have, um, I mean, Cutie and the Boxer to me was the, um, the synchronon of how to do interludes, um, that they just found um, it was about these two artists. This woman tells the story of their love affair and their kind of horrible codependency uh, through these illustrations, um, these moving cartoons, um, and it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. We have some of the greatest. And also done by the quote, non artist in the relationship. Yeah. So uh, that's how her voice sort of communicates. So. Yeah. So we have these brilliant actresses and we have a first time filmmaker um, <laughs> doing it. And, and, and so, um, so, so that's, that's what you get. But, um, but, but I think that, that they worked well enough and they were, they were certainly what we needed and they gave us a tremendous boost. So, uh, so. Well, you do have the advantage. I mean, I remember those clips very well because she, you just really get her character like reading those Paragraph. You let and you let that camera roll a little bit, so she can. You can see the how funny she thinks it, it is yeah. that she even wrote this stuff. So, yeah. um, but it is. You did have a much. You have more to choose from than your your fellow documentary filmmakers here, because you. She had thirty years of so interviews. You're basically saying he had it easy. I don't think. Well, I wouldn't say <laughs> that, but it's a very interesting. You know, it's 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 not personal though. 
Well, in some I respect, mean, we probably yeah. did have it easier. I mean, no, you also, were, well, you're making a film about your mother. That makes yeah. it a, that creates a whole different layer of, and, yeah. and a mother who wasn't just a, a, it wasn't a mother who was known and and um, and adored by so many, and her work. So we, so many people already have a, a con preconceived notion, and so you have to present something. I suspect that. Yes. That look. Look. You can't quantify it, but but we did go in with um, with HBO, which is practically the best partner you can have as a documentary filmmaker of sort of, you know, most people do not have financing when they when they go out and do this. And we, we had our financing in um, in a couple of days practically. I mean it was really well, we're that in itself. Really yes, I you mean, do. I agree. Advantage. He had it easier. <laughs> <laughs> and and just so just I'll tell by you right now. <laughs> by, by comparison, so that was a couple of days. We're eleven years in counting looking for our financing. So if that so gives you So there you go. <laughs> Well, you know, the person th this from my publicity, <laughs> from my fantastic publicity company, is, is in the corner going, "What has he just said?" <laughs> but, um. Well, you know, it's it's a just like any other part of the film business, the industry of film. Um, there are many different ways that we all have to go about raising funds, and you know, I think that I'm I'm fascinated to, about this notion of the cultural documentary. And, and I see that there is a, a change happening among documentary funders um, that they are more open to the, to the cultural doc and not just the social issue doc. I don't, uh, you're gonna ask me the names of no, the No, 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 I'm saying, no, I was gonna <laughs> say that we, um, Melissa and I, we probably applied for 15 grants, I think that's about right, and we didn't get one. Um, and we're pretty decent grant writers, and I, I, think, I think we still found uh, enormously challenging um, without a social action, a, a personal uh, documentary. I just want to say, because I suspect there are some documentary filmmakers in the room, um, and uh, one of the things that happens is you want to give up because you don't really see where your film is heading because it's, it, it's not scripted, yeah. <laughs> so it's evolving. And, um, it's uh, a runaway train sometimes. <laughs> or, or a stalled train, <laughs> and, and I think what's <laughs> critical is the, those people who, um, who give you a lift um, and I don't mean financial, I mean friends who just keep you going. Um, and uh, we, are gonna, we are now, ha we are at the end of a, an incredible journey, and it's thrilling, and to show it, you know, this is like being at Yankee Stadium, at the New York Film Festival, any New Yorker who's, who's raised here, this is the most unbelievable result um, that yeah. we could never, any of us, I, I certainly couldn't have imagined it, but, um, but there are so many who keep you going when you want to, um, uh, um, stop. I do think also that, that one thing we were very conscious of because of our sort of position of privilege as far as these things go was that this was going to be as fast paced as we possibly could make it and I had noticed that Bill Cunningham and Deanna Vreeland and Joan Rivers they all ran right about 85 to 87 minutes and and I really did feel this sense of um, of responsibility to the audience and to other filmmakers that that you don't make it longer than it needs to be. And I know that Laura, both your current movie and your previous one are, are 80 and 81 minutes and, and I'm I'm in awe of being able to to <laughs> do that because I think that um, I think the inclination towards particularly as this becomes a more popular art form, those of us who um, who have willing subjects and financial partners who are really good at finding the story and marketing it and all of those things that we really have a responsibility to our audience um, to tell the story as briskly as we can. Um, I'm into that. Definitely. So. <laughs> well, can you, I'm, I'm going to open it up to the audience for some questions, but I just wanted to just circle back with you just about this question of the uh, challenge of telling the story of an artist, uh, particularly mm -hmm. one as complex as Robert, and unwilling to really do interviews, for example. Like right, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, um, I guess the, the biggest um, challenge was, to, was the photographs, and really how to have them sort of move or have their own world, rather than you know, being stills. 
Um, and to also portray, uh, you know, I have an, also a 90-year-old artist, so it's not like Bill Cunningham where he's getting on his bicycle, even though Bill Cunningham's up in years too. But, he, but he's not the type to get on his bicycle and drive around. But we, you know, I tr we tried to set up things so that it did keep moving. And, and the photographs, I think the music really um, helped a lot. Um, so as soon as we, you know, had a choice of a soundtrack, I think that helped a lot too. But... Um, you know, he was just very giving, Robert, though, too. Um, and I think that in his way, he did give me all these sort of breadcrumbs. You know, he didn't really spell it out all the time, but I think he really gave me some good breadcrumbs. <laughs> well, he, it's interesting that he's, was, he's such a very much c person about control. Yes. Nora also, I yeah. found that fascinating, that, that, that aspect of her character. Uh, that was also about that being in control all the time. Mm -hmm. I just want to give a similar. shout out to, to Ed Lockman here because oh, he's in the film and I think he helped an immense amount. He's been, you know, a support from the beginning and as a friend of Robert's, um, it really helped to have him sit with Robert and have a conversation with him um, rather than me shoving the ca camera in Robert's face. I think it made it mo a lot more fun. Well, so. and I'll mention that Ed is the DP of Carol, which is uh, premiering here next week. And uh, look, up, if you can count all the films he's shot, do, you know, tell me how many there are. There are many, 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 many. This one of our <laughs> great, great directors of photography in the film industry right here. Um, I'll take some questions. Why don't we do that? Yes, sir. Uh, and I'm sorry, we have a mic, sir, so if you just wait one second. I didn't give you enough warning, I'm sorry. Yeah, hello colleagues, thank you for coming. I'm Emmanuel Aronson. I'm a filmmaker and I used to teach films here at NYU and School of Visual Arts. Um, very early in my make filmmaking, I decided to use films also as a vehicle to animate, motivate the viewers to do something for society on social issues or to put somebody on a pedestal who did something for, you know, the world, let's say. And um, uh, it's not in every film, although it's not so necessary, but I thought it's nice to do revolutions through films. Of course, they inform, they entertain the viewers. And um, so I just wanted to ask you if you have that in your films. I'll give short three examples. I made one film on Perceiving the Handicapped that did a revolution from 1979 for families who used to hide a family member who was disabled to get them out to mainstream, for example, on the street, so to say. Second, I educate, educated young Germans about the Holocaust and motivated them to go to Israel and to ask forgiveness from survivors in Israel. And a third film, and that's it, for also young Germans who were motivated by one of my films that was in the Oscar, uh, to look on their own street or small town to what happened then during the Nazi time. So I'm sorry, is your, is your question about the social issues, subjects that they may have put I, in I films? I think maybe your question is, did, did you have a message? With yeah, like film? if you have a message, if you want to motivate, animate the viewer, to do something culturally, socially, or, or even just also to make a film like you did, but thank sure. you. Well, well, I think a couple thank of things. I mean, first of all, certainly we didn't make Virunga, um, you know, which is a wonderful documentary, you know, uh, about poachers in Africa um, that, that came out on Netflix last year. But, but certainly I think that we made a film about the power of telling one's story and um, and how that liberates a person and also the complications that arise from that. And um, because I think that the inclination towards self-expression is, is, is one of the most fundamentally human um, things. And I think that that's true whether you're talking about Nora Ephron or Malala Yousafzai. I mean, I, I just, I think that almost every story about social justice is about the right of people to tell their own stories, right? Um, and, 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 and the 
the, the right that a person has to do that. Um, but I also think that death is our last taboo in a certain way, um, particularly in an era where um, you know, you see what's happening with trans politics very quickly and, and what's happened with marriage equality over the last 20 years. And death remains this, this thing that um, all sorts of very intelligent people kind of collapse into um, kind of not knowing how to discuss. And, and you find people who don't even believe in God using ridiculous terms like passed away. Um, and, and I saw them in some of the obits about my mom, and I thought, um, can't we find a way to talk about death? Um, you know, there was a, a, a fantastic piece that shot up to the top of the Times' most emailed list today about a woman watching her mother die. And, and I recommend anybody go out and read it, because I think that, um, and, and the other piece that just blew me away recently in the Times Magazine was, the piece about the woman who died of Alzheimer's and had decided to end her life and, and what that decision was for her family. And, and I think that's, um, I don't think it's a social justice issue in quite the same way, but, but I do think that it's one of the most necessary conversations we can have um, because there are end of life issues, there are questions of right to die issues, there are, um, you know, th there, there's a massive problem in this country with suicide. I just want to, I just want to pick up on a thread of what, because I, I commend you for- Use your mic. I, I commend you for your, um, for the filmmaking and for the, the um, res social responsibility with which you approached it, but one of the ironies about the film, The Witness, or the subject, is that Kitty Genovese, with her narrative, her story, was actually used as a, um, as a, a, a way of creating a social cause. And as a result, the truth was subverted to, to propel a narrative of a good Samaritan, bad Samaritan narrative. Mm -hmm. The danger of that, the false narrative, we all live with false narratives that shape and form our lives, even a story or a photograph that sits in our home that we believe we grew up with and we think that story is something and it's crafted. That narrative shaped a lot of people's lives. A lot of, I mean, 911 is credited with Kitty Genovese, whether it's true or not. Uh, uh, um, Good Samaritan Laws, credit to Kitty Genovese. The Guardian Angels is credit to Kitty Genovese. But that narrative isn't what it was. And I bring that up because while in the service of doing good, sometimes one subverts the truth. And that's what this, film is about is about a young ma a man not young anymore who is seeking the truth wherever the truth lands um, and so it's so sometimes to do good doesn't necessarily do good even though there's a good message well and it's it's interesting because it's uh, it, it we are talking about death uh, you know e each of your films deals also with this concept of closure what is closure um, how do you possibly end a certain kind of part of your life and move on from that. Is that possible or is that part of life? And is there maybe no closure? Um, it, but it's interesting that each of your films d delves into that. So my thank you, that was a great question. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. And here I would like to offer, uh, if anybody would like to make a film like Laura did about Robert Frank, if anybody want to make a film about me, I have many films, <laughs> lots of archive material of photos and films. So here's the opportunity. Thank you very much. There you go. Yes, sir. Wait for the mic, sir, if you don't mind. It's sort of a follow up to the witness observations. You know, uh, you are implying that when the New York Times decide to define the issue in that particular way, this was in the service of good. I don't quite see that, because the power of the New York Times to define issues or by their reporting or by their silence, about the Holocaust, for example, during World War II, you know, are is extraordinary. We and the film was very appealing to me for that very issue, how a newspaper can define the issue and become to legend, you know, even though it's totally false. You know, I, I just, to contextualize, it's a really interesting point. The, the story, 
uh, it's hard to sort of sometimes contextualize. We live in, you know, in a 50, now almost two years away. But 1964, uh, four, four and a half months earlier, John Kennedy had been assassinated. The cities were, um, were turning violent. And the story was seen as a morality play, defining of um, how the country was, um, in a sense, going to sh in a handbasket. And I mean, there's some irony, because it was sort of everyone is apathetic. The president of the United States, Kennedy, is obviously called to you know, get involved. And, and this story fed into a narrative of decay, of urban decay, national decay. And to what extent the story um, uh, became a sort of uh, self-fulfilling um, narrative uh, isn't entirely, it's very hard to evaluate from 50 years, but when you ask the, the people who cover the story, they admit quite quickly that they didn't really check it. It was sort of a too, too I've heard others say, it was too good a story to check. And, and, and so it became a kind of, um, now I don't, I can't say for certain, Bill Genovese can't say for certain what actually happened uh, and what exactly is the truth, but, um, but the truth somehow got subverted in service of a broader narrative that addressed some of the things that you talked about, the Holocaust, um, uh, why Abe Rosenthal had been a, he was the editor, he had been a reporter in Eastern Europe. He was deeply affected by the Holocaust. So it's an interesting how, um, how a narrative um, is shaped by, uh, well, as I said, good intentions. Um. But also in the, you know, I, I took away from your film a very interesting take on media um, and uh, on journalism. And, um, and it did kind of sh rock my world about my paper record, which I don't, you know, any of us who grew up in New York, I mean, that's actually what some of the power, I think, of your film. Maybe one of us works for the paper. Perhaps, even right now. I well, um, no, no, and to, and to, to their great <laughs> credit, to the to Times' great credit, they revisited their own story. So it's, I mean, it, it, you know, there's a, the, the narrative is constantly being rewritten, right, and evaluated and challenged. And so in 2004, the New York Times, to its credit, assigns a reporter to write a 40th anniversary piece, and that reporter comes back with a piece that's, that begins to question its original story based on a blogger in Queens, a man by the name of Joe DeMay, who has been doing a certain amount of research into the case and sort of not even deep research, although it became deep, and he, in the story just doesn't hold up. Um, so credit to the Times to sort of um, to reevaluate them, themselves. It never will be. Sure, and I think a simple, you're, you're totally right. There, um, uh, you, you, you were, I can't, couldn't say it any better than you just said it. There's a, the power of a narrative sometimes is, uh, is so gripping, even within your own lives, that any uh, number of facts that dispute or challenge that story that you've been holding on to, um, you don't want to let go of the story because it's just, it's a, it's a and, and by the way, the story wouldn't be as resonant if there wasn't an enormous amount of truth in the story. It didn't speak to something that we all sort of connect with. I think we just have time for one more question. Is there another question in the audience from anyone? Mm, yes. Um, some of you talked about building up that trust with your subject and the person that you're interviewing. Um, can you talk about a moment or times when you felt like that personal connection got in the way of maybe sometimes you don't want that person to look bad or there's something that you want to take out because you know them personally, you know they're going to see it. Obviously, it's different for you, but since your family, you know, you, you interviewed your father, things, times when you maybe wanted to protect the people that ended up trusting you that were in the film. Well, one, I mean, one, one thing that, that, um, that I began to grapple with was that, you know, m my mother hadn't gone to my grandfather's funeral. Um, she had been shooting uh, a movie, and, uh, and he died, and she didn't shut down production or anything. And, 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 and it was a sort of interesting thing that her sisters had, and, and it, was, it was a kind of fascinating fork in the road between the most famous sibling 
that, that there's always this little element of, there's, there's a little added ruthlessness and, um, and out of my way. Uh, and, and I really struggled with, was I, was I gonna use that and was I gonna say that my Aunt Delia was, was different in some way because of that and she's also a writer. Uh, and, and, and once I began to kind of go, once I became as ambivalent as I was, I kind of knew that I had to use it because yeah. it seemed to me to be what the movie was about. Um, you know, the things that, that we left out, which we knew were true, had more to do with a feeling that, um, that they didn't add to the narrative, you know. Um, there was a, a kind of hilarious story that we heard about, um, which I'm happy to tell, about B Billy Crystal um, and the, the end of When Harry Met Sally. And, and um, that scene had to be reshot over and over and over again. And, and the reason was that one of the two participants in that screen has been happily married for his entire life. And I don't think he's used to kissing people other than his wife. And so this was a kind of great behind the scenes story that, that we had heard, but, but it didn't have anything to do with the person that the movie was about. And, and so then it was sort of like, okay, okay we, can, we can lose that, but. I'm glad that you said that you used something that you were uncomfortable with using, because I think that's important. Um, I, I think that the one thing that I had to think about a lot is to not put Robert on a pedestal and to not idolize him in a way, because I, I really felt that that would be, um, it, it, it would kind of ruin the whole thing, I mean, to really do that. I think it would make him feel uncomfortable I, it's not what I wanted to do, but it was really hard not to do at some points. Because if you feel like you're learning everything about the person and how, how they struggled and they did all this great stuff. I mean, I went to lunch with him a couple times and I was kind of staring at him <laughs> at, in the, you know, the, out of the corner of my eye and going, wow, you know, like I know him. But like I really tried to suppress that and not have that be in the film. I think that was you know? my biggest concern. I mean, uh, it's a really good question, and, and what's very different about, uh, I suspect, my film relative, it is it, my film is not about a famous uh, person other than, as I said, the way she died, but her friends aren't famous either. Her, the people who, there were witnesses who were not famous. So, um, so in the, no, no one in her life was famous. She's famous, but for the way we've described. And so, um, getting people, particularly of an age, because while a certain generation has grown up in front of a camera, young generation, older generation has not. So getting people to be comfortable in front of a camera, not just getting them comfortable to talk about what they witnessed on the night that this, to, to the brother of what they witnessed that night, which you can imagine would be very challenging. This is the brother who you didn't respond, you watched his sister get murdered or heard something and you didn't respond but I'm going to talk to you now mm. and in front of a camera. Yeah. Um, the, the, what made it possible, and the only thing that made it possible, was because of Bill Genovese. And Bill Genovese is a double amputee. And he has lived his life since he was 19 years old making people comfortable. Because when they meet a double amputee, they're initially uncomfortable and he he comes into the world with his hands open. And everybody who encounters Bill is put at ease because of Bill. And, and so with that comes a certain kind of recognition that the only reason we are meeting this person is because of Bill. And with that then becomes, in a sense, an obligation to not trespass on the relationship that Bill has forged with the subject because it's really through him that that relationship's happening. So we were, Melissa and I, were consistently w aware of, of, of staying, in a sense, a step behind Bill to allow Bill to guide us, which is different than subject making a film about himself where he can set his own limits. We were trying to respect his limits. Now, sometimes we may have push those limits and there is a tension there because you want a shot or you need to move around or Bill wouldn't be having those conversations normally with a camera around. 
but that's how we, it was all through his, um, uh, through him. And so that, that was our delicate uh, balancing uh, act. I do but think that if you don't betray your subject in a certain way, if, if you're not having um, these late night ideas of um, am I g going far enough, I, I do think you have to really push yourself. I think, I, I think it's, I think there are about four traps that documentary filmmakers fall into very quickly. One is too long. Um, you know, just the number of two hour documentaries that I see that are <laughs> too long. Um, the other is being overly enamored of your subject in a way that, um, th that comes at the expense of the film having a real point of view. Um, I agree with that. That was just two. Yeah. yeah, I agree with both. <laughs> I mean, three both and three think, and so four far. are C so two, far. one and two. So, <laughs> so far, you're doing well. Yeah, well, you do have a. The, I don't even know what three and four are. No. Those would be. <laughs> <one and laughs> sounded good. <laughs> I, he, by the way, he C. has a he has a PowerPoint and he can't. He haven't quite gotten there. I have gotten three and four. Well, it, it, it's been really terrific to have you here, and I really appreciate it. I, I really encourage you strongly to see each and every one of these films are really terrific and very different from one another, truly, but um, have so much to say about uh, the form of documentary. And um, please, you're welcome to say hi, and uh, don't try to pitch any of your new projects, <laughs> please. But um, thank you very, you very much. Money for them. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're the people without the money. Thank you. Thank you.